Woi woi, woi woi, woi woi. Then it then up on the radio again. Yo, if you want no smoke free weed, go board yourself. You need to go plant a seed. Go board yourself. Make your knowledge increase. Go board yourself. Go board yourself. All right, welcome to episode 65 of Grow Bud Yourself. We've got a great show in store for you today. We are going to be doing a Best of Grow Q&A episode for you this week. It's a, a compilation of some of our very best grow questions from our listeners answered by Danny Danko. So sit back and enjoy the great grow information here on episode 65, which is brought to you by Rocket Seeds. Sweet Leaf Plant Nutrients, and Excelsior Extracts. Hey guys, I want to tell you about one of our favorite sponsors, Excelsior Extracts. Outcast and TOH from Excelsior are incredible people, incredible growers, and they make an amazing product. Their THC-infused pain rub is made by patients for patients, and it provides powerful relief from pain. This product was developed to treat Outcast's chronic pain, and trust me, this is a super potent topical that really works. You can find out more about Excelsior on Instagram at Excelsior Extracts. That's E-X-C-E-L-S-I-O-R. E-X-T-R-A-C-T-S. Uh, DM them there to learn more about their amazing pain rub. And don't forget to tell them that Grow Bud Yourself sent you. All right, welcome to episode 65. This is Grow Bud Yourself. Uh, I'm Mike G, and you might notice there's a, a certain absence here. Uh, as one Danny Danko is not with us today. Uh, Dan has taken ill, so he is uh, missing the show. But we didn't want to miss a week for you guys. So what we're going to do this week is provide a, a compilation of the best grow questions and answers that we've had uh, on the show over the last year, giving you an opportunity to get all this great grow information in one spot. So this is going to be the Cultivation Q&A episode. And uh, it is episode 65, and uh, 65 brings to mind the initiative in Mississippi that passed on Election Day, Initiative 65, which actually legalized medical marijuana in Mississippi, unfortunately, despite 74% of voters in Mississippi approving that initiative. The state Supreme Court overturned Initiative 65. The 6-3 to three decision by the Supreme Court ended the medical cannabis program before it even began, but that is Initiative 65. This is Episode 65, and um, without any further ado, as my partner might say, why don't we get right into it? Please enjoy non-stop cultivation questions and answers. This is episode 65, Grow Bud Yourself. If you're ready to start your own home grow, you're going to need some seeds. Fortunately, our sponsor Rocket Seeds has you covered. You can find seeds for hundreds of high-quality cannabis varieties at rocketseeds.com, including many of our strains of the Fortnite. Rocket Seeds boasts an incredible inventory of quality-tested cannabis seeds. Whether you're looking for feminized, autoflowering, regular, CBD, or fast version seeds, Rocket Seeds has it all. Plus, Rocket Seeds ships internationally and discreetly and provides excellent customer service. And as a special promotion just for our listeners, you can use the code GBY10 to get 10% off your order at Rocket Seeds. So follow at Rocket Seeds on Instagram. Remember to tell them Danny sent you. And check out rocketseeds.com today and get growing. It is time to take some questions from our listeners here on Grow Bud Yourself. If you have a question that you would like answered on the show, uh, get a hold of us. You can email us. That is info at growbudyourself.com. Uh, what do you say we jump right in? Let's do it. All right. Uh, this first question comes from, uh, maybe he's having an identity crisis. Uh, it comes from Chronic D, but previously he's been D-Man on the show. So, uh, Chronic D, or D-Man, writes, I recently read an article on a research project by RX Green Technologies regarding flushing. Uh, they say that there isn't any difference in flushing or not flushing. 
Now, I've always flushed over the years because it's the standard, but are you guys familiar at all with this research, and is it at all valid? Uh, thank you, and uh, what would you say to D-Man? Yes, uh, D-Man, Chronic D, uh, friend of the show. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, I am familiar with this research product uh, project. I actually participated in this. I was uh, flown out to Colorado uh, in, I guess, the end of last year, 2019. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. So, yeah. uh, other, so a couple other High Times people were involved as well. They wanted us to test cannabis that was flushed at different times. So a two-week flush, one-week flush, three-day flush, and no flush. And here's the thing about flushing. The more you feed your plants, the more you have to flush your plants. And the less you feed your plants, the less you have to flush them. And this is why this, uh, this study found some interesting results. Because I think with this study, what they did was properly fed the plants rather than what's typical is overfeeding. So flushing is something that's recommended because most people do tend to overfeed their plants. This is why you see burnt leaf tips. I talk about this all the time, but cannabis is, is usually overfed. Uh, it's only once in a while when people just use plain water over and over and over is when you know people end up with deficiencies. But the reality is most people, once they buy nutrients, end up overdoing it, and that's why flushing is important. But you really do need to flush, in my opinion, at least a week, no matter how properly you feed the plants. But if you've fed lightly, it's not as big of an issue as if you feed heavily. And I think now that people have turned to lighter feeding and to more organic feeding methods that are harder to burn your plants with, uh, flushing is less and less of an issue. But yeah, like I said, I'm familiar with that study, and I think they found some interesting things. But I think, again, uh, you have to factor in the fact that a lot of people overfeed their plants and therefore need to flush. And so... Uh, you'll notice if you're flushing and it you know comes out, you can test the, the parts per million of the water coming out of your material and know that you're removing some of those excess salts that have built up over the course of you know the vegetative stage, the flowering stage. It just happens that things build up over time, and in my opinion, they do need to be flushed out if you want to get a proper burn, uh, proper clean white ash and the proper taste of the essential oils of cannabis. All right. Very good. Uh, I, I had no idea that you were part of that study, but there, well, that was a weird coincidence. But they flew us out to Colorado basically for, for a one night tasting where we tried four different uh, types of cannabis, the same strain grown under the same conditions, but just flushed at different times. And I thought it was very interesting and it was a fun trip, of course. All right. Yeah. Well, good work if you can get it. Um, the lifestyle of the Denny Danko. Okay, so uh, let's move on. This next one is from Monty, who writes, Hello, uh, hey, Mikey G and Danny D. Thanks for all the growing information. I've almost finished my first cycle indoors, which so far has been very good. I'm a big fan. I've listened to all the Grow Bud Yourself podcasts, and I'm going to go back and listen to all the free weed episodes. My favorites are the ones where you guys speak live without edits. The natural mistakes uh, really make me laugh. Also, the snippets at the very end are funny. <laughs> uh, my question today is, why did I end up with a one autoflower plant when I purchased a 10-pack of feminized seeds? The rest were regular females. Uh, I don't know if it's the same strain, Blueberry White Widow, as the others. Cheers from Australia. Uh, what would you say to Monty? Yeah, I mean, to me, it just sounds like a packaging error on the seed breeder's part or the packager's part. Uh, because if you bought a 10-pack of feminized seeds and one of them ended up autoflower, I just think uh, it must have been a mistake when it came to packaging. Uh, it shouldn't happen otherwise unless there was one phenotype of those feminized seeds that just happened to be autoflowering. But that's pretty rare. And so I would imagine that there was just a packaging error. And then that way you probably wouldn't wouldn't know that it was the same wouldn't know if it was the same strain and it's probably not the same strain in that case but uh to me it, yeah to me it sounds like a packaging error on the seed breeder's part uh unless maybe there was an error somewhere along the line when you planted them but i i'm pretty sure it's probably the package all right uh 
Thank you, Monty. We hope that helps you out. Uh, let's go to Gunja Gonzalez, who writes, Dear Mike and Danny, I was so happy to get a mention and an answer concerning my question on terpenes in episode 34. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so, in episode 23, Danny talked about a very important topic, which is sustainability. I'm a scientist in this area, so every bit of information about sustainability that gets into the public is very precious. My question concerns the use of rock wool. Uh, as far as I know, you need to use rock wool for cloning. Are there other mediums that are comparable concerning root development, success rate, etc.? Uh, thanks again, as always, for the best podcast. So what would you say there to Gunja Gonzalez? Yes, uh, sustainability is important, absolutely. Uh, rock wool, not a very sustainable product. Basically, heat-spun rock. Uh similar in some ways to the insulation that you find in, in roofing and things, but not a very sustainable product and certainly a pain in the ass to work with. You know, if you have to work with it, you really have to get it wet uh, to work with it. If it's dry, it has those shards in the air. It's very dangerous to, to even breathe in dry rock wool. Uh, so you have to work with it wet and it stays very wet. And that's one of the reasons why it's great for cloning, but certainly not the only way that you can clone plants and um, not even necessarily the best medium nowadays for that. I mean, what makes it good is because it stays moist, allows oxygen to reach the cut end of the root so that it's wet, but also uh, not soaking wet to where uh, it just rots and molds. So, I have used rock wool for cloning. It does work well for cloning. It's actually pretty easy to clone in rock wool. And if you're just using those one inch by one inch cubes and then plopping those into uh, a much larger amount of grow medium, it's not the end of the world to just use a little bit of rock wool in that way. But if you're trying to avoid using rock wool altogether, there certainly are lots of, of alternatives, including just regular potting mix that's just moist and kept moist. And, and the important thing about cloning is to keep the uh, the area moist and the clone warm. So you can do that with cocoa. Uh, you can do that with peat. You can do that with, uh, they have uh, even those little cloning trays. Just fill them up with soil, keep them nice and moist, not soaked, but moist, uh, so that when you squeeze it, uh, some moisture will come out. And I like the plastic lids over the top just to keep that moisture in a bit. And you can root right into this, your soil mix and then transplant right into your larger containers filled with soil mix and avoid using rock wool altogether, which, you know, doesn't ha it has a forever shelf life. It doesn't really degrade very well, isn't f pleasant to work with, uh, makes you kind of itchy. Some people are allergic to it uh, and is not a great product, really, uh, for the environment. So th those are some of the options that you can use. You can really root plants pretty easily as long as you keep them moist and warm. All right. Moist and warm. I think we can all get behind that. Uh, thank you, Gunja Gonzalez. Let's move on to listener Dallas, who writes, Hey, guys, I love the show. I'm curious about growing in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, now that we have home grow. The problem is, in the summers, it's not uncommon to get up to 118 degrees here. Wow. Uh, with these temps, is growing outdoors just a no-go? Would switching up the seasons work? Uh, can I plant in the fall when it starts cooling down and then harvest in the spring? Uh, winter temps here are usually in the high 60s to 70s, and we only get a frost once or twice a year overnight. Uh, should I just stick to indoors with AC? So, uh, what would you say to Dallas about growing in uh, Arizona? Okay, uh, I would say... Yes, you should just stick to indoors with an AC and make sure it's a powerful AC. Uh, make sure you have uh, humidity levels at the proper, uh, you know, area as well, 50, 60 percent, uh, because all that heat can really dry out the air AC as well. So um, is growing outdoors a no go? Uh, 118 is really hot. Um, you really... Uh, anything you can do to protect those outdoor plants in the summer if it's going to be that hot. Um, you know, uh, sheet cloth that, uh, that'll that keep that from being, the heat from accumulating too much at the leaf surface. 
would be helpful. As far as planting in the fall and harvesting in the spring, uh, you can do that, but you would have to supplement the lighting because uh, fall lighting is automatically going to make your plants want to flower. So if you supplement the lighting, you could do it in a greenhouse uh, with supplemental lighting in the fall and then use light deprivation um, as you approach the spring uh, in order to make the plants flower um, at 12, 12, 12 on, 12 off. So it can be done, uh, but p p just putting them outdoors uh, in the fall, uh, you would definitely have to supplement the light to keep them in a vegetative stage um, throughout the winter. So it, it, it can be done, but you would need some type of a greenhouse with supplemental lighting. Uh, should you stick to indoors with AC, definitely, uh, definitely do that. Uh, and if you can build the greenhouse that we talked about, do that as well. Very good. Uh, we hope that helps you out. And uh, let's move on to a listener who um, whose name uh, you and I have been absolutely butchering, apparently. Uh, we, I believe, would say something like Cannabifermen, uh, but uh, he writes, The pronunciation of my handle is Cannabi for men. And that apparently is a line Method Man says in the movie How High? All right. I've seen it, but I don't remember. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I, of course, I know the film. Our friend uh, Reggie Noble, Mr. Red Man, the funk doc himself, uh, stars mm -hmm. in that with Method Man. Uh, yeah. But I, it's, I guess it's been a while. I got to go back and uh, give that an, a, a, a pandemic viewing. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> we have the time. Yes. So, uh, so can a buy for men uh, writes, so I'm closing in on my first harvest in a few weeks and uh, I need as many harvest tips as possible. The best temp humidity, jar sizes, amber glass versus regular glass, uh, things to look out for, etc. A list, if you will. I also have a couple of questions. First, I have concerns about how to take them down best in order to hang them. A few details on my situation. I have a uh, BC Northern Lights dryer box with fan and carbon filter. Uh, based on previous tips related to harvesting, I pulled the screens out and hung 12 hooks with 10 pound capacity from the ceiling of the box. Secondly, how long is the hang dry process before committing it to jars? Uh, thanks again, you guys are the best. What, what would you say to uh, Canna Buy For Men about his harvest? Yes, okay, so um, it's great that you have that, uh, that dryer box uh, with the fan and carbon filter. Um, again, that you're hanging the plants to dry is great too. Uh, best way to take them down in order to hang them, uh, if depends on how big the plants are. Uh, if they're three feet or smaller, I would just hang them as whole plants, meaning I would cut the cut them at the base and then just hang it whole like that. Maybe take off some of the bigger fan leaves. Uh, if they're bigger than three feet, I would do them sort of branch by branch, cutting from the top cola and the first branch, uh, cutting from first at that node from the top down creating that uh that v-shaped uh kind of hook uh and hanging them that way um as far as the amount of time uh the hang drying process should take you at least uh seven to ten days uh to do it properly um so you don't want the fan blowing uh too hard inside that that box uh you just uh, as far as temperature the cooler the better i would say the closer you can get to 60 degrees you know if you can keep it 60 65 or so uh that's best for not uh losing a lot of the uh, uh essential oil you know the terpenoids and, and flavonoids and and all of that humidity uh you know should be maintained around 50 percent or so maybe 40 percent uh not a lot higher a lot of water and moisture is going to be coming out of your plants um, so keep that in mind. Um, jar sizes, I like just the, you know, the regular sort of 16 ounce, uh, glass jars. Uh, amber glass is better than, uh, see-through. Light can degrade THC, so keep those in a cool, dark place. Um, let's see. Well, the best way to know, uh, after that your hang drying process is complete is to bend the branches. Uh, so if they snap, uh, when you bend them, you're ready to cut those buds off and begin the curing process in the jars. If they bend, uh, there's probably still too much moisture there. So that's a, a good kind of roundabout way of knowing. 
Uh, now those buds will feel dry on the outside, very much you know popcorn dry, uh, but there's still a lot of moisture in the middle uh, that needs to work its way out. So when you take those buds off, uh, trim down you know some of that sugar leaf that's on the outside and pop them into the jar, seal up that jar uh, for a few hours, open that up and you'll feel that moisture has redistributed and it's now moist on the outside of those buds again. So you do that over and over again. That's the sweating process that we call curing and you will be ready to smoke that uh, after a few weeks or so of that curing process. And it'll only get better over time as long as you keep them in a cool and dark place in sealed glass jars. Enjoy your first harvest. There's nothing better. All right, nice. Well, thank you for the uh, harvesting tips, and we hope that helps you out, uh, Can I Buy Four Men? Tropical 170. Uh, I love your podcast. Look forward to new episodes each week. I'm growing weed in a tent. I somehow introduced spider mites into my grow. I deployed a bunch of ladybugs, but they're not working fast enough, and I think this crop is headed for the trash bin. My question is... How do I get rid of the infestation after I trash the plants? Is spraying the tent enough, or do I have to bomb the whole room? Uh, there's no carpet in the room for them to hide in. I really, really hope I can get rid of them, because growing my own weed is the only way to get some, unless I drive to Massachusetts from central New York. That is, until the uh, New York legislature gets its shit together in the next legislative session, LOL. Uh, keep up the awesome work. What would you say to Tropical 170? Yes, uh... Unfortunately, you know, spider mites are very persistent. Uh, once you get rid of your plants and, you know, trash those, uh, there's quite a possibility that those spider mites are going to remain in that tent. Uh, you definitely need to spray the tent uh, all throughout the inside, everywhere you can. I recommend maybe getting a mop uh, and like a bleach, uh, you know, solution and really getting into every uh, you know, the ceiling, the, the floor, the, the walls of that tent, uh, as well as, you know, any surrounding area. So the room that the tent is in uh, is also a perfect place for those things to hide the outside of the tent as well. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt to basically sanitize that entire room that that tent is in. Uh, and then maybe, you know, wait uh, a few uh, weeks or maybe even a month or two uh, before reintroducing plants into that space. Uh, like I said, spider mites are very persistent. They can hide uh, in very tiny places. They can hibernate for long periods of time. Um, so good luck. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope New York legislature gets its shit together as well uh, so we can all start growing without the fear uh, of uh, you know anything happening because of it. I should just mention, I added the LOL that wasn't in the email. That is my personal uh, feeling about the situation. But we hope that helps you there, Tropical170. Let's go to SMG, who writes, uh, You are the best cannabis podcast to listen to to keep us cannabis growers motivated in these troubled COVID times. I am using a full range of nutrients from a well-known nutrient supplier for a micro autopot cocoa grow. I've heard uh, many different views on mixing nutrients. In what order would you add the nutrients to your reservoir? Would you add uh, the base nutrient A and B first, or would you add the additional nutrients such as rooting, PK, CalMag, etc.? Uh, what would you say to SMG? Yes, I would add the base nutrient first, uh, the A and the B, or whatever the you know the grow or the bloom, whatever period that you're in. I would add those base nutrients first. Um, that's typically the the, the you know the most uh, that you're going to be adding, and then any sort of additives, uh, CalMag, and such, uh, I would add after the base nutrients are already added. Uh, stir that all together, let it sit, and then check you know the ppm's and the pH and temperature of that solution uh, after everything's been said and done. Um, so yeah, that's the order that I would add nutrients uh, to a reservoir. Very good. We hope that helps you out, SMG. Let's move on to Ben. He writes, uh, hey, Danny and Mike. Thanks so much for answering my questions on the show a few weeks back. I'm ready. I'm very nearly ready to germinate my seeds for my first indoor grow. I have one small grow tent kit arriving with a small T5 light for germinating and the first couple weeks of vegging, and then a larger 8x4 grow tent kit with two 600-watt high-pressure sodium lights. 
Uh, because I'm going for eight plants in a scrog, the screen of green, I'm going to need a fairly long veg period. Will the high pressure sodium lights be okay for vegging? I've heard that you should veg under metal halide instead of sodium. If I need to use metal halide, can I use the same ballasts and just get a couple 600 watt bulbs? Thanks again uh, for the show, you guys. You rock. Uh, what would you say to Ben? Okay, um, so you you don't have to use metal halides for veg. You can use your high pressure sodiums for veg. Uh, but if you really want to, uh, you need to make sure that the ballast you have is switchable between the two styles, and not all ballasts are. So if you have one that's just specific to high pressure sodiums, I would definitely not switch it up with a metal halide bulb. Um, because uh, they take different ballasts, unless you have a ballast that runs either type of light. So keep that in mind for sure. Um, thanks for you know enjoying the show, and don't worry about just using the high-pressure sodium for veg. Um, your plants will be fine. Um, they're getting a good amount of light. It's not you know perfectly ideal. You would want you know halides or or uh, uh, even the uh, ceramic metal halides even better um but uh you can you can veg under uh hps so you know don't stress and you know eventually if you want to switch it up uh and you know combine the two or have metal halide for veg and high pressure sodium for flour you can do that um but again like i said you can do it under the hps okay uh, we hope that helps you out there ben uh okay so um most of the people who write in are pretty complimentary of the show. They generally like it. Otherwise, why would they listen? Um, but sometimes we get an email that's, you know, offering a little constructive criticism, uh, like this one from Mike, who writes, uh, you guys have an excellent podcast. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, please tell Danny to stop saying you know and you know what I mean so often. Uh, last episode on one answer, he said, you know, you know what I mean nine times in a short paragraph, it's making me nuts. Other than that, I really love the show. Keep up the good work. I, I just have to say, I haven't really noticed this, but on the other hand, uh, I've been recording with you for nearly a decade now, so I might just be blind to some of your, you know, uh, expressions. I don't know. Quirks and mannerisms. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I will try not to say those things uh, as much <laughs> as possible. Wow. All right. Uh, I mean? Sorry that Dan's making you nuts, but welcome to my world. Uh, let's move on to. Uh, no, I Mark. definitely appreciate constructive criticism, so thank you, and I will. Uh, I'll try my best. Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you, Mike. Let's move on to um, Mark, who writes. Uh, this one. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a longer one. He writes, uh, "Hey guys, first off, I would like you. I would like to thank you for the podcast. I'm currently training for my first ultra marathon and spent a lot of time running each week while listening to podcasts." Uh, I particularly look forward to each Friday as I blaze, and then I head out for my run while listening to the latest Grow Bud Yourself, though I do get some weird looks sometimes as I run through downtown, giggling to myself as I go. <laughs> okay, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a grow question as such, but instead a request for a more in-depth look at ventilation. Grow talk often focuses on things like lights, growing medium strains, etc., while ventilation is mentioned more like an afterthought. I've listened to tons of interviews with growers, and almost all of them point out how important the environment is, so it would be great to get some pointers on how to create that environment. For instance, questions like how to correctly calculate a suitable extract fan size for your setup, uh, in which situations is an intake fan needed, etc. So um, so what do you think, Dan? Some, some tips on proper ventilation? Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, ventilation is, you know, uh, paramount. In completely uh, con in controlling the environment, in uh, controlling odor, and in changing up the air. So um, as far as calculating a suitable uh, fan size, you want, um, you know, you, you basically calculate your square footage and, uh, you know, not even square because you actually calculate cubed footage in, in a way. You want the whole uh, room's foot, you know, square footage and you calculate that and you want a fan you know that's cubic feet per minute so the cubic feet uh is you know length times width times height so uh once you have that your cubic fan uh cfm uh cubic feet per minute is going to determine the size of your fan and you want to basically 
remove the air in your room every five minutes or so. Some people do it a little more, some people do it a little less, but if you can kind of dial it into about every five, um, then you have the right CFMs. Uh, but again, that's going to be different depending on your, the size of your setup. Uh, in which situations is an intake fan needed? I mean, pretty much in every situation, unless you're doing an in, a completely enclosed grow, which some people do, um, but you still got to bring in air somehow. Um, and you always want to be sort of sucking out more air than you're bringing in in, the, in that way, um, you know, not to suck in too much. Um, and also, you know, the bends in your ducting affect the efficiency of the fan. And, you know, as I look over your question, there's a lot of interesting stuff here about, uh, you know, running fans continuously or on a timer. That all depends on if you're uh, infusing your room with uh, carbon dioxide, because you certainly, you know, want to shut off your exhaust when you're uh, putting in CO2. Uh, let the plants absorb that CO2 and then pull that air out. Uh, so if you're using CO2, you want your fans on a timer. If you're not using CO2, not as important. Um, as far as staggering intake and exhaust fan timers, doesn't really make too much of a difference. As long as one is on, you should have the other one on. And uh, is it a good idea to have your fans temperature controlled? Uh, yeah. I mean, when the temperature hits a certain you know, high degree, you want to be able to suck some of that hot air out. And that's why uh, controllers are so great. You pay a little extra money for them, but you plug into a controller that can actually monitor those things for you, um, whether it's heat or humidity or, uh, you know, any other factors basically that you want to be controlling. So um, proper ventilation is very important. And, uh, you know, certainly how you create your environment for your plants is so important to the health and, and well-being of those plants. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you to Mark for pointing that out to us, and we appreciate you listening. Uh, so let's go to Matthew. He writes, Dear fellas, uh, thank you for helping me to push my growing potential. I have two plants that came from the same bag where I found my seeds. Uh, I have been feeding them the same, but one plant always looks like it has too much water even when dry. Please help. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're overwatering, uh, but if it's happening even when dry, your plant's drooping, uh, that may be a different type of issue. Uh, the water could be not getting to your roots, basically, like pouring straight through your soil and out the bottom. Uh, or this could be an issue as far as the pH of that soil as compared to the pH of the soil in the other container, not allowing the plant to live, basically, and, and stressing it out and making it look... Uh, saggy. Uh, and, you know, so I think it sounds like uh, if it looks like it has too much water, it's drooping. Uh, and it could be that uh, you're watering too often. Uh, and different plants have different needs at different sizes. So uh, you can't treat every plant the same and expect them all to behave the same as well. So I think uh, your issue is going to be somewhere in that soil. Okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, okay, so thank you, Matthew. And uh, this is from Darkoman25. He writes, uh, Hi, guys. I love the show. I binged the first 31 episodes in about three weeks. I also bought Danny's book, The Beginner's Guide, and I feel like the podcasts go hand in hand with the book. I'm emailing uh, because I'm in a bit of a pickle. My wife won't let me grow in my basement. I spoke to her about the possibility of growing indoors back in September, she mentioned the idea doesn't sit right with her, just a gut feeling. She's also expressed concern with keeping the product secure from our kids. Uh, we have a three-year-old and we're expecting another one soon. I'm in Illinois, where cultivation is decriminalized. I can grow up to five plants, and if I were caught, it would be a $200 code violation, comparable to a speeding ticket. Uh, I've explained all this to my wife, but she still doesn't want me to grow. Can you give her a call and convince her to let me grow? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, any advice, research, resources you could provide that will help me change her mind? Uh, any ideas on how to keep a grow tent secure? I really appreciate any input. So uh, what would you offer up to uh, the wife of Darkoman25? <laughs> well, first of all, I would say uh, don't, you know, don't push this issue. Uh, you know, I'm married uh, almost 20 years and uh, I, one thing I can tell you is if she doesn't like the idea of it, she's certainly go not going to like it if you go ahead and do it. 
uh, without you know approval. And um, so the, your your first job is basically to either convince her uh, that it's no big deal and that you're going to take care of it and, and keep, obviously keep it out, you know, away from the kids and, and, you know, all of that. But, uh, at the same time, if she's against it as a possibility and an idea, um, you know, once she starts, you know, smelling that smell coming up out of the basement, uh, which is almost inevitable when you're growing and harvesting and, and drying and, and curing and all that. I mean, it's in the same house. Uh, and at that point it's going to drive her nuts. And uh, it could really get in the way of your relationship. And so my first advice is not to grow uh, at all. Uh, and basically, you know, either. But but say it wasn't a, um, a marriage situation. What advice would you just give somebody who was up in the air, say, about whether they should uh, grow in their home in <sighs> Illinois with the right. decriminalized? Growth? I mean, honestly, if, it, if you're up in the air about it and you haven't even started doing it, then I would recommend not doing it because uh, it's a commitment. It's something you really have to uh, take care of a lot that you're taking on. Uh, and it has repercussions. And those repercussions could be, uh, you know, your this your security. There could be, uh, you know, things with repercussions with your family. And, uh, you know, it, it, your your wife is, is right that it, it, you know, it puts you at risk. Even if, um, you know, even if you're not caught, it's technically you know still uh something that you're doing in your home that's risky and so you know i mean you can there's ways that you can you know mitigate that risk and convince your wife that those you know those risks are worth you know you growing and if it's you know it's hard for me to come up with that because i don't know you and i don't know your wife but um you know my advice would be you know show her the book uh, you know, maybe get her to listen to a couple of episodes growing, you know, it's a hobby and it's, it, it's a, a thing, but if you take care of the odor and you take care of the plants and you, uh, take care of the security part of it, um, you know, maybe there's a way to convince her. I don't know. But, um, my first inkling upon, you know, reading what you're saying is that, you know, uh, you really probably should just hold off on it until you have that green light and that it's like a bright green light and not a hesitant green light because it's going to get worse when you're actually doing it and you're actually involved in it and uh like i said if you're in the basement and she's one floor up above your grow uh it's going to cause some odor and you know possibly some resentment and <laughs> well yeah. okay just uh, just real quick uh i hate to be you know like a, a a pill about it but mm. that's the reality of the situation you happy uh, wife happy as... life as to yeah, exactly, uh, but as to his other uh, question there, just very quickly, uh, uh, ideas on how to keep a grow tent secure. Yes, I mean uh, keep it in a locked room uh, that your kids can't get to and and you know have no access to. Uh, make sure you have proper ventilation and odor control going on at all times. Have a place also secured, not just to grow but also to dry and cure. Uh, your plants that's not going to seep up into your, your you know living area um, make sure all of those things are taken care of and you may be able to pull it off uh, you know the the only thing is you know you just make sure she's 100 percent on board and you know part of that is convincing her how important it is to you but also uh, you know what the benefits are for you for uh, you know maybe maybe there's a way to do it i don't know but good luck. Wow. Danny Downer over here. All right. Um, <laughs> hey, man, I, I'm just being realistic. Like, yeah. do you, you know, it, you want to grow good. or you want to be married? Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, that's the type of decision you're facing. So um, if it's that way now, it's going to get worse unless you fix it and make it right. So good luck. And I uh, hope it works out. Sorry about that, Darko Man 25 Okay, Chad writes, Hi guys, thanks for the awesome podcast. I'm curious if there is a best time to train your plants with LST, uh, low stress training, perhaps after watering? Uh, I know I've snapped a few branches here and there, so wondering if there's a best time of day to do your training when plants are most pliable, least likely to snap uh, with a little too much pressure. Thanks so much. So uh, what would you say there to Chad? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And the, the honest answer is, I don't really know. I, 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 I would assume, as you said, uh, that after watering would be best because the plant would be more pliable. Um, but at the same time, yeah, that's a great question. I, I wonder if there's uh, listeners that could pine in on this or chime in on this and let us know their thoughts. Is there a good time to actually bend and train your plants with low uh, stress techniques? I mean, you certainly want to do it with the newest growth. You know, you don't want to use uh, lower branches that have more or that are thicker or more woody. So I would say, you know, start with the 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 youngest growing shoots. But as far as well, the time of day, that's interesting. I, I, I'd be interested to know. I, I'm assuming that, uh, you know, ba- basically about a half hour or an hour or so after you water, would probably be ideal because the plant would have the most pliability at that point. But uh, again, I never really thought about when when the best time to do that is. So great question, Chad, and hopefully uh, some listeners can write us either at Patreon or, or uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or wherever and let us know what their thoughts are on timing of actual plant training. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, Chad's getting into some next level stuff, but we appreciate that. So, um, all right, excellent. Let's move on to Bobby. Uh, Bobby has a lot of, um, of beginner questions here, so hopefully you could help him out. Uh, he writes, uh, do you guys have a list of supplies on your website of what I would need to start my own indoor grow using six foot tall grow tents? Also, uh, what seed bank would you recommend to buy seeds from? Should I use autoflower or feminize seeds? And what website would you recommend to get the grow tent lights and supplies from? Uh, so what would you say to Bobby? Wow. Uh, well, that's a lot of questions, but as far as a list of supplies on our website, we don't really have that. Typically when you buy a grow tent, you get m- almost all of the supplies you need, basically everything, but the genetics. Um, I would buy a kit, you know, I wouldn't just buy an individual tent. I'd buy a tent that also comes with lighting that also comes with, uh, fans and, and, and things like that. You definitely need, um, fans obviously to control, uh, the airflow and bring in fresh air and move out spent warm air through charcoal filtration. So you need filters, you need lighting, uh, you need containers for your plants. I would not buy, you know, a whole hydro setup in a tent. I would just buy, uh, five gallon buckets or or 10 gallon buckets or whatever I would want to use for that uh, and just hand water into a a soilless mix or cocoa or something like that rather than some complicated hydro system. Uh, Seed banks, uh, I mean, I love uh, Rocket Seeds. I think that's a great company. They have a wide variety of strains from all over the world uh, at great prices. Should you use Autoflower or Feminize Seeds? Only if you want to. I mean, if you want autos, the benefits of that are you get your flowers faster. You don't really have to worry about changing the light cycles. Um, people talk about diminished potency with autos, but that's changing as well. Uh, should you use feminized? If you don't want to waste time growing male plants, uh, you can use feminized seeds. I like, personally, I like regular seeds, but again, I would grow regular seeds out. I would take clones of everything that grew out of those regular seeds and then I would flower the clones and I would pick the best and strongest of those to be a mother plant from which I would take clones uh, if I wanted to grow the same thing over and over. Uh, And as far as a website uh, to recommend to get your grow tent and lighting, how about sweetleaf.com? I mean, that's our friends uh, and it's S U I T E. L E A F dot com. Uh, you can use code Danko 15 for 15% off. So, I mean, you can imagine if there's a thousand dollar grow tent kit on there, you can actually save yourself 150 bucks just with that code alone. And if you join our Patreon, you can get a 20% code, a 25% code. It's pretty wild. So, and free newts and free nutrients as well. Yes, if you join our Patreon at any level, even the four dollar and twenty cent level. So thank you to Sweet Leaf. They make a great nutrient, but they also sell uh, these grow tent kits, and I highly recommend buying it from them with our code Danko fifteen. And that's basically the answer to your question, Bobby. Thank you. 
All right. Yeah, thank you, Bobby. We uh, we hope that puts a little dent in some of the questions that you have. Uh, let's hop over to Patreon. Take a question there. It comes from Donna, who writes, uh, Could you remark on the strains Goji OG and Jordan's Ghost? Uh, here's what I know. They're both high in humulene. A cursory visit to Dr. Google noted appetite suppression as the prime quality here. Always a plus in my book. But there must be more. Both of these strains work very well for me, better than anything else so far. Have I stumbled onto the best pharmacological remedy for ADHD? Hmm. Uh, what would you say to Donna here? Um, it's interesting. Uh, I, I do know Goji OG. I have heard of that strain. I have smoked that strain. I do know something about humulene. And w one of the things about it, uh, one, most interesting thing, is humulene is a terpene that's also found in hops. And it's actually responsible for that hoppy taste that you get um, in a good IPA. And, you know, if you get a hoppy beer, uh, it definitely has a lot of humulene. Hops and cannabis, very closely related, um, basically cousins. And other strains that are high in humulene include uh, Sour Diesel, Headband, and White Walker. So clearly it has, you know, that uh, that type of effect i would imagine like people say about the sour and the headband and goji og and white walker it's it just grabs you by the forehead sometimes makes you sweat a little bit and it's an interesting terpene because of that now as far as appetite suppression i hadn't heard much about that from humulene in particular although that's always a good thing unless you're trying to gain weight um i think it's definitely something that would be of, of valuable research for pharmaceutical companies and things like that. But if you can find something that works for you, especially, you know, you mentioned ADHD, um, appetite suppression. Uh, if you find the strain that works for you like that and, you know, it's got it's high in humulene, it's quite likely that other strains that are high in uh, humulene will also work for you in that way. So interesting stuff. You know, I mean, like I said, it's in it's not only just in uh hops either it's also in sage uh ginseng okay cool yeah we hope that helps you out there donna uh let's stay over on patreon and uh, go to carolyn who writes uh, this is important here for her uh, is it possible to overwater an outside plant a heavy clay soil in already humid vermont warning this may resolve a marital dispute <laughs> Uh, I'm having trouble grinding my cannabis. The grinder breaks it up, but it stays on the top, not falling through the holes. Could it be too moist? Uh, I dried to about 60%, no issues with mold. So uh, what would you say here to Carolyn and, uh, you know, weigh in on this marital dispute? <laughs> yeah, um, it is possible to overwater an outside plant, particularly in the conditions that you're talking about. So if you have a heavy clay soil uh, and it's already humid in Vermont, as you mentioned, you can overwater that plant. Uh, my recommendation is to add compost uh, to loosen up your soil and make sure it's less heavy clay, and that'll make it more difficult to overwater it because it'll let the water through. Um, but yeah, if, if, if you're in a, a really mucky, wet area, like a swampy kind of area, you can certainly overwater your outside plants. Uh, so it is definitely possible. It's harder to do that outside than it is inside just because uh, nature typically has ways of, of either l allowing that water to soak down further into the soil or to be evaporated. Um, but as you mentioned, in humid Vermont, you can overwater in a heavy clay soil. So that's hopefully uh, going to resolve your, your dispute there. As far as trouble grinding your cannabis... Uh, you said you dry to about 60%. That's not dry enough. So even though you say you have no issues with mold, I don't think your cannabis is dry enough. I think you want to get to 25% or less, typically from the original wet weight. So, you know, if it's a pound wet, it should be about a quarter pound dry, um, about down to 25% of whatever your wet weight is. And if your grinder breaks it up, but it stays inside the grinder and not falling through, it's definitely too moist. Okay. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. All the best to, to you. We hope that helps you out. We'll go over to Facebook here. Uh, this is an anonymous uh, message. Greetings from Denmark. Hey, Danny. I'm a listener of Grow Bud Yourself and Free Weed. I have a weird question. I know a grower who has had some strange problems with critical cush. 
He takes cuttings from cuttings and flowers out the bigger plants he has taken the clones from. But then, all of a sudden, the smaller plants in the veg room went into flower, and they never fully went back into veg even after weeks. WTF happened. Um, he has grown skunk number one for years like that, new cuttings every week, and harvests uh, one or two a week, and then repeats. Are there some strains that you can only grow from mother plants and not clone of clones of clones? I uh, hope you'll answer me. So so what would you say to our anonymous friend from Denmark? Yes, I would say that it sounds to me like your friend got a hold of critical kush that's actually auto-flowering. So therefore, no matter what, you can take cuttings from it or whatever. It's going to start flowering at a certain age. And I think uh, it's not going to work out for him to take clones unless he takes those clones super early. And that's also hard to do because uh, the plant starts to flower at a certain height. So uh, one of the advantages of auto flowers is you just plant the seed and grow the plants. One of the disadvantages is you can't have an auto mom uh, to take cuttings from. And even taking cuttings of a clone of a vegging one is also going to start flowering. So you can't really grow them big uh, unless you have an auto that actually gets taller. So there are like auto hazes and things that actually won't flower until they're a foot or two. But all of them start pretty young. And so therefore... What, that's what I think happened. I think your friend got auto-flowering, critical kush. Typically critical and strains like that uh, in Europe have those auto uh, tendencies in a lot of cases. Maybe it wasn't labeled auto, but turned out to be. Uh, maybe they were mislabeled or something, but it sounds to me like your friend got auto-flowers, and that's why those plants are flowering automatically, as you know mentioned in the name. All right. Makes sense. Uh, thank you anonymous for writing in okay let's move on to angelo who writes hey danny and mike i love your new podcast uh, i've been binge listening for about a month now and truly enjoy the content even though i don't necessarily grow yet i've recently heard about pgrs and how harmful they can be when smoked i know you guys have talked about people uh, using non-organic nutrients in their grows and how they should flush prior to harvest are pgrs simply for aesthetic purposes uh, what are your thoughts on them, and should people think twice before smoking really dense bud? I think there's a big misconception that good indoor is super dense. So what are some precautions consumers can take, especially in non-legal states? So, uh, yeah, what would you say there to Angelo? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, first off, PGRs are plant growth regulators. Um, these are uh, naturally occurring chemicals that act kind of like a hormone um, specific to plants. So uh, what they do is they inhibit what the plant's growth hormones want it to do. Uh, so basically they keep the plants short. You know, they've, they've been used in agriculture and landscaping for a long time. And there are naturally uh, derived PGRs that are perfectly fine. Actually, like we talked about uh, with sweet leaf nutrients when they were on the show, um, these include kelp, uh, chitosan, uh, Trichotinol, uh, and then there's chemically derived synthetic PGRs. These are not uh, naturally derived, so it's not coming from kelp. It, this is developed in a lab. Um, these are hard to pronounce, but uh, you know, deminozide, uh, which is also known as Alar, A L A R, if you see that in a product, or uniconazole, <laughs> and these are sprayed on plants uh, to help them to grow more uniformly maintain certain attributes and basically if you think about growth regulation it just means it inhibits growth and keeps them from stretching and has those buds densed up like you talked about and the chemical ones are no-nos in my book uh, but not all dense buds are grown with pgrs and indoor is denser in some cases just because of the way that it's grown and some buds are dense because of the way that they're packaged uh if they're like pressed up together and, and or mushed together or vacuum sealed or that sort of thing so keep that in mind uh but again if you're growing for your own personal use there's no reason to use pgrs i mean we're not growing poinsettias you know this is something you're going to consume so you should be very concerned uh if those type of synthetic pgrs are in any of your newts i mean chemically derived pgrs 
are known to cause cancer, uh, poison the liver. They're environmental pollutants. You know, these are not anything that should be on cannabis. So I want to be clear that there's a, a risk to your health and it's a real risk. So keep that in mind. And the difference between natural PGRs and chemically derived PGRs is vast and great. So can keep that in mind as well. Okay, so um, there you go. Uh, stay away from those PGRs. Thank you, Angelo. We hope that helps. Let's move on to Brian. Brian writes, hey, Mike and Danny, uh, I've been binging your show, and I've recently set up my first grow. I'm using a 3x3 Mammoth tent with a 315-watt PowerSun CMH LEC light on an 18.6 cycle and Fox Farm Ocean Forest floor as my medium and feeding with a 20-20-20 fertilizer made by a local hydroponic company here in British Columbia. Uh, is this setup and fertilizer enough for the flowering stage? What would you say to Brian? Yes, I would say um, the setup is enough, uh, although you are going to need to change your light cycle, so you'll need a timer to change that light cycle from 18.6 to 12.12 when you start your flowering stage, uh, unless you're growing auto flowers, I guess, which you didn't mention. Uh, 20, 20, 20 fertilizer is really kind of an all purpose. Uh, so it will cover, you know, everything, but it's a little extra, um, you know, nitrogen for flowering period. So it's kind of like a catch all. Uh, and I would definitely recommend using a different fertilizer, f uh, for the vegetative stage, uh, compared with the flowering stage. Um, uh, but at 20, 20, 20, like I said, it's, that's kind of a catch all. So if you had to do it with that, you could, as long as you were feeding properly, um, so you do have everything you, you need for the flowering stage. Um, uh, but I would potentially invest in a, in a, a, a grow or a veg, uh, fertilizer for that initial stage of growth and a flowering or bloom fertilizer for the second stage of growth. Uh, if you're a beginner and if you're not, then you can look into, uh, all kinds of newts and additives and things that you, you want to dial in. Very good. All right. Uh, we hope that helps, Brian. Let's move on to D-Man. D-Man writes, uh, hey, slick buds. <laughs> okay. Uh, I enjoy your show. I've been considering growing CBD plants for the past couple years due to different injuries over the years. Uh, I've been growing for many decades, but not that educated on the CBD craze. So, yeah, what would you say to, uh, to D-Man about growing CBD? Yeah, I mean, if you've been growing for decades, it's the same process. You just get seeds uh, that are CBD-rich seeds. Uh, you know, the, not the seeds themselves, but they grow CBD-rich plants. And you grow them out just like you did, like you would with your high THC plants. Uh, and then you consume them in whatever way you would choose, whether you want to smoke uh, those high CBD flowers or turn them into... Uh, extracts, hash, tinctures, all kinds of different options for you, depending on how you want to consume that. Uh, but the growing process is almost exactly, if not exactly the same as uh, growing high THC plants. You, you, you know, plant the seeds, you grow them through the vegetative stage, you flower them for uh, approximately 60 days or so, and you, then you harvest them and trim them up and dry them. So the process is really the same. It's just that the genetics of the plant, uh, induce plants that have a high CBD content and a low THC content. So um, it's really no different as far as the growing process. Now, that's very different if you're growing hemp plants. So let's make the distinction between, uh, you know, hemp plants that are being grown uh, for CBD that can can be grown completely differently as as far as, you know, CBD rich cannabis plants, which are slightly different from the hemp varieties uh that are grown for different purposes so keep that in mind but if you're growing like you know dynafem cbd blue dream or something like that that process is the same all right so uh there you go d man thanks for reaching out we got time for one more here so let's go to a rod probably not that a rod but an a rod he writes uh, i'm a grower for medical use and i grow outdoors my problem is it rains like crazy where I live, which means that there are snails everywhere and they've invaded my garden. They're eating my poor plants alive. What can I do to get rid of these bastards and make sure they don't come back? Any advice uh, would be appreciated. Thanks for what you do. So what would you say to, uh, to A-Rod? Yeah, you know, this is uh, one of those pests that doesn't really get their due. 
uh, but actually does a lot of damage. Um, and snails can be a serious problem for outdoor growers and especially for young plants, plants in their vegetative stage. Uh, once they start flowering, I think snails are a little bit less of a problem. Uh, but when, when it's a young plant, they can really destroy it. And um, so signs of snail damage would be those gross mucus trails that they leave behind uh, and the holes in the leaves of the plants that they're eating. So uh, one good idea is to spread diatomaceous earth around your plants that will discourage snails, slugs, any of these kind of slimy, gross uh, creatures. Um, another way to keep them from harming your plants is to maintain a dry top layer of soil, um, but that requires watering from below. Doesn't sound like that's possible in your particular outdoor rainy situation. Um, I love this other method, which is uh, sinking a cup of beer into your soil. You basically make a hole in your soil the same size as a cup, push that cup down into there, fill that cup with beer, uh, and leave the rim of the cup basically right at soil level. The slugs just can't resist the yeast and the beer, and they are going to drop right down into that cup and drown. Uh, and it's gross because you get a cup full of gross uh, slug beer, uh, but you do end up killing a lot of slugs that way. So that's a good way to do it as well. Um, there's also another method, uh, which I really don't want to recommend. Uh, it's products like Deadline. Um, actually, Sluggo is actually a safer alternative if you have pets. Uh, but I would be remiss not to mention them. I mean, these are like the nuclear option uh, of slug killing products. You basically spray a thin line of this gunk about a foot or so in diameter around the base of your young plants. Uh, and you do that in the evening uh, and every month or so. And the snails will stay away. But I don't really like the thought of that stuff seeping into the soil uh, and being part of my uh, ecosystem. So like I said, that's really a last resort. Try the beer cup, uh, try the diatomaceous earth, and hopefully you will rid yourself of your slug problem. There you go. Get rid of those slugs, those snails. We hope that helps you out, A-Rod. And uh, good luck with the Hall of Fame voting in 2022. That should be interesting stuff. Thanks to everybody who uh, wrote in to the show today. If you have a question that you would like answered, email us. That would be info at growbudyourself.com. Uh, what do you say we take a little break, come back, and then wrap this up? Let's do it. If you're a grower or you're thinking about starting your first crop, then you need to know about Sweet Leaf Plant Nutrients. Sweet Leaf has an incredible line of organic fertilizers and, of course, their legacy line that includes organic and some synthetic fertilizers. So check them out at sweetleaf.com. That's S U I T E L E A F.com. The code DANKO15 gets you 15% off everything at Sweet Leaf. That's 15% off their signature line of nutrients as well as essentials like complete indoor hydroponic grow tent kits and grow lights, plus awesome apparel, backpacks, and much more. If you join our Patreon, you'll get access to additional codes worth 20 and even 25% off. All Patreon supporters also receive free Sweet Leaf nutrients just for signing up. Sweet Leaf provides all the tools necessary for the modern gardener. Check them out at sweetleaf.com and remember the code DANKO15. All right, here we are, and uh, I'm alone, but we're wrapping it up. Uh, episode 65, Grow Bud Yourself. We hope you enjoyed our uh, cultivation Q&A episode. That was a lot of fun. We hope that you learned something today, and um, we also want to remind you of our sponsors and the various codes that can help you save some cash. So we'd like to thank Excelsior Extracts and their THC-infused pain relief rub. Also, Sweet Leaf Plant Nutrients, if you enter the code DANKO15, that will save you 15% off everything over at Sweet Leaf. So go to sweetleaf.com and be sure to use that code DANKO15. 
uh, Rocket Seeds. Rocket Seeds has the, the code GBY10, and that gets you 10% off everything over there at Rocket Seeds. So please give them a, a visit, pick up some seeds. And uh, one of our affiliates, Vapor.com, you know, they've got everything. If you're interested in the uh, the Puffco Peak or any other uh, pen or vaping device, all sorts of great stuff over at Vapor.com. We recommend you guys check that out. And you could use the code GROWBUDYOURSELF20, so just just uh, all one word spelled out, grow bud yourself 20. That's good for 20% off everything over at vapor.com. And check out our Patreon page if you'd like to uh, to support the show yourself. That's patreon.com slash Danny Danko. Um, there's lots of great opportunities there. If you if you join, even at our lowest level, you're going to get some free plant nutrients from Sweet Leaf, as well as other great stuff, including at certain levels a signed copy of Dan's book, and other great uh, gear, merch, all sorts of fun stuff. So check that out. Join us on Patreon. Subscribe on YouTube. Check us out there to see what we're doing. And, uh, you know, don't forget to get in touch with us. If you have a question, like one of the questions that we answered on this very show, uh, you should send it to us. Email is best. Our email is info at growbudyourself.com. And lastly, uh, you know, I'd like to thank the uh, the listeners. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for all your support. And, um, you know, we'll see you back here next week, hopefully with a healthy Danny Danko. Uh, this has been Mike G. This has been Grow Bud Yourself, episode 65. Let's put this one in the books. 